I want to see this accelerate the pace of human progress. As engineers, if we kind of like learn some recipe and just apply it over and over and over again, in my opinion, it's kind of a waste of time. Like, I think it'd be cool if as engineers, what we did was focus on proving that some breakthrough idea was possible. And then as soon as it is like, sure, show it to the computer, have the computer go figure out where it fits best. Today, I speak with Sergey Nesterenko, CEO of Quilter. Sergey started thinking about the aspects of deploying artificial intelligence in hardware design during his time at SpaceX. After realizing how AI can save time on hardware development, Sergey founded Quilter to make PCB and circuit design less time intensive and more cost effective. Quilter is a very exciting solution in the growing AI ML space and is currently in its restricted beta phase. What sets Quilter apart is its ability to recognize circuit design improvements, international standards, and possibly more in the future. What difficulties has Quilter faced trying to go to market? How does the closed beta community work on finding new features and exceptions in the run-up to a public release? Here's our conversation. We live in a time where design and technology touch every aspect of our lives. But where did it all come from? Who designed it? How is it built and brought to market? What will it look like in a year? Two years? A hundred years? From the phones and smartwatches that help us in our day to day to the cutting edge spaceships and 3D printers that are leading us into the future, modern design is constantly shaping the way we work, communicate, problem solve, and play. And every new design, big or small, starts with an idea and a bill of materials. I'm Magenta Strongheart, and this is The Bomb, where we talk to leading innovators in the tech world and celebrate the transformational power of design. Well, welcome to The Bomb, Sergi. Thank you for joining us here today. I'm really excited to learn more about Quilter. I just heard about it from Chrissy when we did our interview around Chrissy and Root Ventures a couple weeks ago, and it was really intriguing to learn about all that you guys are creating for engineers to develop PCB layouts. So yeah, thank you. I'd love to get an introduction from you as far as uh, what the company is doing, maybe the kind of elevator pitch, if we can start there. Sure. Yeah. So Quilter is basically generative design for circuit board layout. Um, so our long-term goal is to basically convert any schematic into a ready-to-go PCB layout that can just be sent to manufacturing and uh, and kind of done and be good to go. That's crazy. I feel like that's going to be totally game-changing as far as optimizing like the efficiency of this process. Uh, you taught yourself how to code when you were 10 or you were yeah. younger. Can you tell us a little bit about your kind of path up to this point, up to being an engineer at SpaceX. Um, what brought you there? Why were you interested in engineering? And yeah, sure, anything you want to sure. share. How far that. back do you want to go? <laughs> as far as you're willing to, with, within, right. you know, within reason or any of the highlights you think are worth mentioning. All right. I mean, I think the first highlight is Legos. Okay. I, I Classic. Probably not We've alone. heard that a few times yep. yeah, on the pod. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yep. So that's pretty straightforward. Um, you know, so I actually grew up in, in Ukraine. Like Lego um, should sponsor us because we plug them. Oh, 100 percent. 100 percent. Um, yeah, so I, I grew up in Ukraine. I had a lot of access to like, uh, like, you know, my grandpa's garage, for example, where I had like lots of like stuff like, you know, wood and tools and whatever else I could build stuff. That was kind of like the next step up from Legos where you had to make your own little mm -hmm. parts instead of just being able to grab them from a box. Um, you know, I think after that, when I came to the US, um, I got interested in video games, which led me to programming. Um, it's kind of also a pretty stereotypical story for software engineering. Um, then, you know, I kind of went through school and then college. In college, I was most interested in going into research. So I actually was headed in the path of like, can I do physics or chemistry or, or mm -hmm. mathematics as a pure kind of researcher? Uh, and um, when I finished college, I was like, well, okay, like I kind of know what research might be like. I've done a little bit of it as an undergrad. I have some sense. I don't really know what it's like to work at a company. So let's just go do that. <laughs> um, so I walked into a career fair, saw SpaceX and was like, okay, that's cool. Let's try that. Um, that was lucky to to be accepted there, uh, and uh, I loved it. Um, you know, it was just really awesome to see an amazing group of engineers build something really cool and really fast paced. And um, what year was that that you started at SpaceX? I got my offer in 2013. Okay. Um, so I was kind of there. I think Falcon 9 had flown six or seven times wow, when I got okay. my offer, uh, and it was uh, well over 100 by the time I mm -hmm. left. Um, so pretty fun time for yeah. sure. Yeah, I would say kind of the an exciting period for them when a lot oh, was yeah. happening, right? Oh, Absolutely. Yeah. Nice. And so then what kind of inspired you to get into this work? Yeah. Um, so honestly, I think that the real inspiration came from, you know, working at SpaceX. Um, you know, I was an avionics engineer. 
uh, for a little over five years there. And so I got to really see like uh, what happens when you try to design rocket electronics uh, and all the different like bumps that you hit along the way. Um, and of course, uh, I had the same experience as, as a lot of people doing layout for the first time. You know, I didn't do a layout in college, didn't even study electrical engineering, frankly, um, you know, came to work and had to do a board. And then I started sitting there and laying one out by hand. It took me a while, it took me a while to learn. Uh, I was using Altium at the time. And I thought, like, why isn't a computer doing this? Yeah. Uh, and then, like most people, I tried an auto router and was like, this is terrible. And then I for <laughs> promptly forgot about it, never used it again. Um, and so it wasn't until uh, six, seven years later that through different circumstances, I got the opportunity to start a company and get some funding. Um, and it kind of in a reverse way, got to think about, okay, well, what do I actually want to build? Uh, and I pulled back on my time at SpaceX thinking, well, what did I not like? You know, what mm -hmm. problem do I want to solve? Uh, and came back to this one as kind of a, an interesting and impactful problem I can solve in the space. Absolutely. And so what has been the most uh, kind of, it sounds like, you know, you were thinking about research, then you spent some time at SpaceX in a big, bigger company, not huge, <laughs> but bigger company. And then you went full into startup mode. What have been kind of the unexpected positives of the process? Like what's been most exciting or interesting that you really didn't see coming? I, I think in my opinion, the most exciting thing is um, the willingness of people to join on something like this. Um, you know, I, I was afraid when I started that like, I'm just this, you know, a guy and I have some crazy idea that people have been trying for 60 years. <laughs> and like, why would anybody like spend, you know, their working life, mm -hmm. like hooking up with me and working on this. Um, and I think one of the cool things about startups and especially about hard startups um, is that it really attracts people. Like we are, have been really lucky to attract amazing talent at Quilter. I mean, mm -hmm. really, really, really top-notch talent. Um, and I think what excites people about joining and working on this is that it's hard is mm -hmm. that we might fail, um, you know, and that was a little bit of a surprise. Yeah. Um, I always thought people would be looking for like the kind of obvious, immediate, insightful idea easy leads money. to an easy win. <laughs> yeah, right? That's yeah. the kind of incentive. But, but it's no, not, I mean, I one of the things true. Chrissy said was that's what made her get into, um, you know, investing is that she was like, I actually found that I love the kind of roller coaster excitement of, you know, the risk and the possibility that it might not work, but if it does, it's going to be incredible and you get to be a part of that whole journey and that kind of, you know, yeah, I don't want to say the drama, but the excitement of it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, drama, drama's fair as yeah. well. Okay, kind of trivial question. How did you guys come up with the name Quilter? <laughs> um, so I have to give the credit to to one of the engineers, um, it's Michael Arcidi um, who, uh, when we were switching from, you know, doing uh, kind of physics simulation first to actually doing the generative design, uh, he started a code repo and he thought, well, I guess it's kind of like making a quilt. And so he called it quilt. <laughs> nice. And that was it. And it stuck. Yep. <laughs> there you go. Simple as that. Very fun. And so when did you officially kind of start the the PCB layout idea? Um, like how many years ago or what was the timeline on that? Yeah, I think so. We um, I mean, we got funded in October 29. Well, that's not true. We got funded in December 2019. Okay. Um, from October to December, I was learning like, what is a corporation? And, like, <laughs> All <laughs> the other the side help. of the business side. <laughs> that's right. <Yeah. laughs> that's right. Um, and I, we didn't take on the PCB idea in earnest until like August or September of 2020. Okay. And our actual first stab was to, um, so like an important part about Quilter, I should back up for a second, is that um, it's not, we're not the first people to have tried to automate layout. Mm -hmm. Like uh, there's papers that date back to the 60s uh, that have been doing this for so 60 years of efforts. Um, but one thing that we think a lot of people have missed or that we think is really important is to combine uh, like the proof that the board will work with the ability to generate that board. Mm -hmm. So ergo, we have to combine physics of simulations of boards with the actual ability to generate boards that pass those physics. I was going to say, is that physics. through simulation? Yeah. Exactly. And so the first thought, thought was like, well, why don't we just build like an easy serve physics engine first where people can upload boards and evaluate them and then get things started that way and then come to the generative side. Um, so we probably spent, uh, I don't know, four or five months building that out first before deciding that like that wasn't unique or interesting enough. I was going to like, say there people. must be existing solutions for that, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah to an extent there are. Um, and so, um, yeah, I'd say in early 2021, we actually like started trying to generate circuit boards. So, I mean, I had met um, Chrissy uh, when I was even just starting the company. Uh, she was one of the first calls I made through somebody else just about like, should I even quit my job and start a startup? <laughs> and if I do, what should I go build? Uh, and we were doing some amount of ideation there. Uh, but once we pivoted into the PCB idea, I think that's when she kind of saw like, okay, like that's something I can hook into and mm -hmm. that makes sense. 
Yeah. Um, and so, yeah. Yeah, it's right up there, there, Ali. I feel oh, like as far 100%. as tools for other engineers and developers, it makes a lot of sense for their kind of portfolio. 100%. Yeah. 100%. You said that you kind of started Quilter a little bit in reverse as far mm. as like you got the opportunity to get funding. Um, and was that through Root right off the no, bat or Root wasn't different first. opportunity? Okay. <laughs> Can you walk us through that or is it? Sure, sure. Top no, I mean, <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah. I'll tell you, then I'll have to kill yeah. you. Right? Um, no, no. Um, so I, after I left SpaceX, I went to another startup um, where I was working for just a few months. Um, and I took on a lot of side contracts, uh, as a lot of people do. And for one of those side contracts, turned out to be for an investor. I didn't even know he was an investor at the time mm -hmm. uh, who had me help him value at a different company. And long story short, after a few weeks, he you know reached back out and told me that he wasn't going to proceed with that investment for one reason or another and said, hey, how'd you like this startup? company and i said what <laughs> wow <laughs> what, what did you say um so you know we had some loose ideas about like um the first idea was to build low-cost sensors for manufacturing okay and we thought okay you know sure like why not um yeah. you know i can take my experience in building these things and uh you know get some funding hire a team and, and try it out um and so that's kind of why it was a little bit backwards right it wasn't the process of like i have an idea and a pitch deck and i've yeah. pitched dozens of investors and finally got funding it was mm -hmm. a little bit the opposite um luckily um, which is pretty amazing yeah someone really just you know believed in you and was like he can make something great happen <laughs> yeah yeah no I, I i feel really lucky that, that that happened absolutely and how big is your team now we're nine people okay now. nice and where are you based uh so we are fully remote Okay. Um, I All think over. four of us are in Los Angeles, two are in the Bay Area, we have a couple in Colorado, uh, somebody in Texas. Uh, and it, over the course of the company, we've kind of always, we started like right before the pandemic happened. Mm -hmm. uh, and then as the pandemic unfolded, we kind of just stayed remote. Interesting time to and, start anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was not anticipated. Mm -hmm. um, but, it, but it works. I mean, you know, it's mostly a software company, so that's obviously quite easy to collaborate on. Um, obviously, we, I have a, an electrical engineering team in addition to myself, and we build hardware. But, you know, with boards, it's not that hard to collaborate and, you know, mail them to each other, build two copies and simultaneously mm -hmm. work and so on and so forth. Yeah, kind of prototype in parallel. Yeah. Um, for when you were starting, did you end up bringing on any co-founders or did you continue to just take this on on your own kind of as the leader of the company? Mostly myself as the lead. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And do you feel like... You know, one of the things we were talking to Chrissy about is kind of, you know, Root really can support with everything else, you know, besides not they also support the technical hardware and engineering side of things. But, you know, something that I think is valuable to most um, firms and incubators and accelerators and all the people that can support is kind of that everything else, the business side, the marketing, all of that. And so have you found that like, did you have a natural interest or appreciation for learning some of those things? Or have you really leaned on other, you know, other talent on your team or um, investors or support outside of the company to to really push that stuff so that you can really focus on the, the technical side? Um both, in short. Um, so first, I have a lot of interest in it. Um, I think in a lot of ways, those things are, you know, like en engineering is a little bit more straightforward, right? Like you roughly know where you're going. You have some plan of how to get there and you kind of deduce the problem, break it apart. I don't know. I find <laughs> things like marketing are a little bit more mysterious, at least to me. <laughs> um, but I like that. I mean, I think that's great. And there's just so much energy in like talking to people, seeing how they respond, sh changing the way you think about things based on, you know, how people are responding. Um, so I'm very excited to be a part of all that and to participate in it, uh, but I've never done it. I'm not any good at it necessarily. Mm -hmm. And so that's where I lean on the people who are more experienced. Uh, so in Root and, you know, Harrison Metal, my first investor, um, and, you know, people who are angels who uh, have experience with this or friends or just anybody really right. um, to kind of like share their wisdom and experience and in, in how to go about it. Something Chrissy mes mentioned also um, when you guys were first starting, there's some really interesting outputs from the tool as far as mm. layouts that uh, you wouldn't expect or that like a oh, yeah. human probably wouldn't create. Uh, do you have any fun anecdotes from that kind of process or still that you guys are kind of filtering out? I'm sure it's a never ending process in a way as far as what's been unexpected or, uh, you know, something that did actually work, but you just realize a person never would have come up with that, you know? Oh, yeah, lots. Um, so I think that's kind of the second category of like cr different critiques that people have had. Um, so getting away from like, is there insufficient information to even do this task? Then there's how are you actually performing this task? And I think those critiques fall roughly into two categories, which is like looking at a board and having va a valid reason to think, hey, this might not work. Uh, and then looking at a board and thinking it might not work because of a misconception. So one uh, simple misconception is we use um, traces that go in any direction. 
So when you look at a typical circuit board, you, what you are used to seeing is what's called octilinear traces, where they go, you know, left, right, up, down, 45 degrees, mm -hmm. um, which kind of comes from the history of like when these were designed literally by hand and drawn with rulers. So our traces are not like that. They go in any direction uh, and they usually follow smooth curves around pins or around other obstacles. Interesting, yeah. And so they look really weird. Um, <laughs> everybody who looks at them, myself included, are yeah. like, wait, whoa, what is this? This alien right? <laughs> PCB language. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's, it's very unnerving, for sure, uh, when you first see it. Um, and I've had people actually ask me, like, hey, is that even manufacturable? Mm -hmm. Like, can you actually even create that? Um, and of course, if you understand, you know, etching and how manufacturing works, of course you can. Yeah. But it kind of shows the the gap between kind of what's possible and how ingrained we are. And how we've like kind of to. limited ourselves. Yeah. Just because of what we're used to and what's been traditionally done. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And I think that's kind of applicable to a lot a lot of areas where, you know, machine learning is starting to you know, take more of the lead or be more of an influence. Um, I think it's interesting to think about even, yeah, even just what we we're saying, like how much is um, just kind of a fear of the unknown, you know, and what uh, we're not used to versus obviously what would really work or make sense for the future. So do you see quilters sort of like filling in those gaps when, um, when you can't have kind of the full professional support for something like this? Yeah, I mean, I see, uh, yes, that's certainly one of the ways I see Quilter. I mean, I see it kind of in a, in a few different ways. Um, I think like uh, freeing up time for people is certainly one thing we strive to do. Um, so whether you're more of a full-time circuit designer or maybe you're a firmware engineer and just don't have support from an electrical engineer at all, uh, you can offload layout and you know we can take care of it. Uh, or if you're a professional layout engineer and you want to focus on the difficult projects and you have a bunch of easy projects you just want to churn out, th that's certainly one way. Uh, but that's honestly like not even the most exciting thing that I, I really see it with. Um, what I really want Quilter to do is to make electronics easier. Um, so like I find a lot of inspiration in like how easy can we make it to make a board, mm -hmm. you know, and um, if you look at uh, software engineering as a comparison, you know, how many 10 year olds out there have taught themselves how to code, yeah, you know, like myself absolutely. included, right? But like if you have a 10 year old who can learn to make a board, well, that's maybe a lot more impressive right now, but it mm -hmm. shouldn't be, right? It should be just as easy. So like what I really would want Quilter to do is to make electronics a lot more easy. Easy, right, so that we can kind of, at the high level, share parts of schematics with each other, share sub modules, and then like when somebody gets a creative idea and throws them together, it's like ten minutes to make the design, send it to manufacturer, and then like get the board back in your hands. Ideally, in a couple of days, and so go start playing with it. Absolutely, have the ten year old send their boards to the to the, <laughs> not, <laughs> the not contractors. Yet. Um, we have <laughs> no, but I mean, we've had. Um, uh, a lot of interest, obviously, from a lot of different folks. Uh, and I think the youngest group of people has been uh, some high schoolers um, that uh, from one of the education centers that reached out that's really who are interested in, in trying to use it. That's yeah. awesome. Like, yeah, I definitely totally. want to see that. Absolutely. So you guys have recently launched kind of your first version that people can uh, publicly like try out, right? Yep. Yeah, yeah. So we're on a wait list. Um, people can come and sign up. Uh, I read everybody's uh, sign up. Wow, so nice. it's great. <laughs> of course not. And I try to respond to everyone. Um, it's exciting to see what people are thinking about doing mm -hmm. and everything. And just to meet people. I, I, I love meeting people this way. Um, but yeah, I mean, most people that, you know, as long as I think that, you know, Quilter has a chance of actually, you know, generating the kind of boards you want. Yeah, I welcome people in and then let them play with it and give us feedback. And then when did Root get involved with the venture? So Root got involved... Oh, I'm blanking, Chris, it will kill me. Yeah. Uh, I mean, but it was about a year and a half ago. Okay. Um, yep. Okay. So maybe a year, you were saying December 2020. So maybe like a year after you Something guys were like really um, formally or formalizing the the idea that you were going to work on. Yeah. Um, in this, you know, latest version that people are can sign up to get access to, uh, is that part of the kind of user feedback, you know, loop that you're questions or survey or whatever you're asking after people use it, if they would have more of a preference? Or is that just stuff you guys are kind of testing internally and deciding and working on? Oh, no, we we ask users for everything that they're willing to give us, <laughs> yeah. right? Um, but I, I think so far for right now, it's more important for us to get answers to the questions we didn't even know to ask. Um, so, you know, we will have some some kind of basic questions in a survey. We actually haven't even started sending out uh, regimented surveys. Mm -hmm. uh, I honestly just reach out to people directly and say, hey, what did you how think? How's it going? You know, yeah. How's it going? <laughs> Uh, and like, as they kind of give me some thoughts, you know, go back and forth and everything and just have a dynamic conversation. Um, you know, I think in a regimented survey, the most important question that I think will spawn everything else is, did you choose to manufacture this board? 
Mm-hmm. And you know, if you and why or why not? Yeah. yeah, and then if you did choose to manufacture it, how did it you know did it turn out? Did it work or not? That, that's ultimately the job of a PCB is you know just yeah, make it work. work. <laughs> right, right. Like um, of course. You know, um, so we don't like specifically ask, like, what do you think of the curvy traces? But mm-hmm. most people will give us an opinion. They'll let on you that. know anyways, yeah. <laughs> of course. Definitely, I think in this this kind of audience too, this group is happy to share that kind of feedback. So where were we? Oh, I was just gonna say, I feel like you guys have already kind of proven um proven that out in a way, you know, that the even when it comes to something as specific as layout, it has gotten stale as far as what we've been able to do on our own, right? Like the fact that the computer is coming up with these traces that is are kind of freaking people out, you know, and yeah. feel like impossible when the computer is saying, no, it, these will work. And you guys have been able to prove that, right? Um, it shows that there's so much more that we can be focusing our kind of creative energy on beyond sure. the, yeah, just the, the, um, the processing of this. Yeah. And I mean, I think there's branches that come out of that. So obviously, like if you were looking at layout, you know, the next thoughts are, okay, let's look upstream into the schematic design process, right? And like, how can we bring, we talked a little bit about modularity. I think that'd be a really important thing to bring into schematics. Um, You know, the ability for somebody brilliant to go design some super hyper efficient power circuit. And then for a kid to go just implement them and be like, sweet, that. now uh, it works. That's so cool to think about. Um, yeah. We, we need to have stuff like that too, to really like make exponential progress um, you totally. know, in, in everything. Uh, of course, there's the other side of like, I'd love for Quilter to integrate much more tightly with manufacturers, um, right? Like uh, one of the pains of PCB design is like, you have to go to a specific manufacturer, figure out exactly what they can and can't do. Uh, and then if you have to switch, that can be a real pain sometimes. No, that's a whole other world um, that needs to be optimized. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, of course, like if you have some component or part missing or some material for the PCB or, you know, as we've all seen with components themselves, mm-hmm. like uh, having to change that can be a lot of pain. That's uh, where supply so- frame comes in. I'm like, shameless. <laughs> yeah, no, of course, of course. Yeah. <laughs> uh, like all of this should kind of be like, um, okay, now I have an Intel i7 instead of Intel i5. Cool. Same compiler gives me an output yeah, and now it runs. No so, problem. Done. Just, yeah, just swap it out. Of course. It really does seem like, you know, the, the possibilities are kind of endless once you start going down that rabbit yeah. hole. So that's super exciting, I feel like, as a space to be in. Sam Altman, who was the head of YC for a while, has a really good kind of little short spiel on why it's great to start hard startups for, for this reason. That like, you know, if, you, if you're if you yet another chat GPT application, like there's going to be hundreds of you and good mm-hmm. luck. <laughs> uh, but if you're trying to start a fusion company, like there's not that many of you and that really excites people. And so like attracting talent and potentially even attracting investment gets easier. Mm-hmm. It's a little counterintuitive, but, uh, but it's great. So maybe I'll want to encourage people to, to look at hard startups. Yeah. What are you guys thinking about as far as how to address that in, I don't know, quick start or how to get people, you know, adopted easily to something new and kind of foreign feeling? Yeah. I mean, it's an ongoing debate. Uh, I mean, we, we're still frankly having the debate of like, do we just embrace the fact that these look weird and like focus on proving that they work? Or do you try um, to optimize them to fit more what people are used to? Right. And and I think both are valid answers, right? Yeah. I think I think it's definitely or maybe possible. maybe it's a phased approach of like in be. the future. Yeah, like, there can be all of it. Yeah. Yeah. Like I, I think it's certainly possible to set that as a constraint and have the kind of optimizers like figure out how to fit within that constraint. Um, I think it's also a valid argument that in a lot of cases, you know, a curved any angle trace is actually better. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, as long as you actually got the design done, you're avoiding sharper angles uh, and and for signal integrity purposes that can actually help. Um, and honestly, I don't think we've made the decision yet of like, which side do we lean into? Do mm-hmm. we try to optimize it to make it look a little more human first and get more people kind of accepting at it? Or do we just lean in and say, yeah, this is definitely computer generated mm-hmm. like, um, and, and kind of focus more on uh, actually building boards to show people that they work, that it works, investing yeah. in simulations to show that they work and so mm-hmm. on and so forth. Mm-hmm. No, that's a tough decision. That totally makes sense. And so what are there, are there any applications you guys are kind of steering away from right now that you don't support boards for a particular vertical or use case or anything like that? Or is it really open at the moment? Yeah. Um, so we, we tried to think about Quilter in terms of verticals, like, you know, do we go for aerospace or automotive or whatever? And I actually don't think that's the right way to cut the segment for, for Quilter. Um, I think that the right way to segment uh, users right now is by capability, right? And so today, what Quilter can support is boards that are of some, you know, uh, technical parameters. So roughly, you know, less than 100 components, less than 1,000 pins, um, relatively low speed signals. So like sub a couple hundred megahertz signals, relatively low power. So sub couple of amps of power, right? Uh, and you'll find that those boards exist, you know, both at startups and within aerospace companies, mm-hmm. uh, all the same. 
So it, it's actually, I think, a little more appropriate to think of it by like the job function or the, yeah, the, the technical standards kind of right. or so, limitations. Like yeah. if you were designing, uh, you know, the motherboard for Apple's iPhone, like we can't help you yet. Um, but <laughs> one day, <laughs> one, yes, absolutely, one day. Uh, but if you are designing a test rig for that motherboard that exercises some functionality, uh, then absolutely, like you have lower constraints on density. Um, you know, maybe you don't have as much like high speed compute and stuff like that. And and Quilter can kind of make a lot of sense there already. Uh, and so over time, of course, we'll, we want to expand that to everything. Um, mm -hmm. We don't really see a limitation to it long term. Uh, but for now, yeah, really, the application is just what is our technical capability? Like, what are the kinds of boards we can actually complete and give a good quality to uh, versus like what we're kind of striving to achieve next? Maybe it would be a good time for our listeners to illustrate, you know, imagine people are just listening, they can't see anything. Sure. <laughs> illustrate, walk us through the process of someone using your tool for the first time, like step by step, what do they do and what do they get out of it? Sure. Um, so the the first part of the process in building a board, you know, is designing the schematic and that remains like normal. So you, you know, you open up KiCad or Altium and you, you know, you have some idea of what you want to build and you draw up your schematic like you always have, right? Um, the second part is assigning footprints. Uh, and again, uh, completely like normal. So we kind of think that most people have opinions, whether they're in a company that has a library or they're using Octopart or something, um, they'll assign the footprints that they want to use for their layout. The third part actually is to start your board file. So we take in as a constraint the outline of the board that you want to use, presumably because you have some you know, mechanical enclosure or something where the board has to go. Uh, and most customers will even uh, place some components. And in particular, that will be connectors. So like if you know exactly where your USB connector needs to go. Yeah, they need this according to their enclosure or whatever it is. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Like we have no way of knowing it? where the screen needs to be, mm -hmm. right? Or something like that. Um, and that's it. So at this point, you have a board with uh, an outline or with some key, connectors key placed yeah. and everything else is off the board. Uh, and you just take that board and you drag and drop it to Quilter. Uh, and some amount of time later, you know, anywhere from 10 minutes to a few hours later, um, you get that same exact board file back, but it's done. Mm -hmm. um, so it's got, you know, power plane and ground plane. It's, everything's connected. And does it just give stuff. you one option or does it kind of give you a few to choose from with pros and cons of why you might yeah, want one or the um, other? We, I mean, we generate... I think right now over a thousand different candidates. Um, so we do have some prioritizations already. Uh, obviously, we want to give you the ones that are like at the very least complete and past mm -hmm. DRCs, right? That's kind of the, the basic criteria is that like this board actually connected everything as the schematic required uh, and um, it can be manufactured by this and this and this manufacturer. That's the kind of the basic criteria. Um, we have some basic choices right now in terms of like, you know, we have a two layer variant, a four layer variant, okay. um, you know, some things like that. Um, but that's going to increase quite a bit in the future. Like, uh, you know, in the future of the company, I imagine that like, um, you know, maybe you have a trade off between uh, signal integrity and cost, you mm -hmm. know, or like the size of the board in the X, Y plane versus the number of layers or like things like that. Yeah, no, that'll be so cool. I feel like the same way, you know, we've been able to optimize like searching for all different options of I'm like any part of our life, you know, looking for a house or looking for these things, you can have kind of parametric, you know, parameters, you can have your sliders on of what you want and what, you know, is a lower priority as far as your output for, for the board. That's really crazy to think about. It's exciting. Is there any feedback you've gotten so far that has been surprisingly like, um, I don't know, negative, I guess, like people have been like, for whatever reason, there's no way this is going to work for this or, you know, what was the most surprising kind of, uh, I guess, anti, <laughs> you know, sure. kind of criticism of the, sure, of the sure. project so far? Um, yeah, I mean, I think the most substantive concern about like a long term why this might not work is the question of do you have sufficient information to do this job? So as an example, right, like, um, you know, if you look at a layout and you just see a bunch of parts and you don't know what the parts are, how do you know that something needs to be impedance matched or something's a differential pair or something is a high current? And mm -hmm. of course, if you don't know that, you make a wrong assumption and you make a board that just ultimately isn't functional. Um, and so what ends up happening is people assume that that's going to have to be entered in by hand. Uh, and that if that's the case, then, well, is it really faster to do that than to just like do the layout yourself? Mm -hmm. um, I think that's been kind of the most important uh, criticism. Um, and our plan for that is to eventually ingest data sheets, basically, so that yeah. 
as we look at whatever it is that we're doing layout on, we understand what each pin is, and ideally, what are the technical constraints of that pin. Um, you know, so if you have uh, some application where I don't know, you have a clock signal or some digital communication, um, you understand what speed it's going to be at. You're going to understand the impedance. You understand what crosstalk it can tolerate, and you actually prove that that crosstalk will be met uh, according to all the no other noise sources. Um, you can't do that for everything, right? So you have boards where, like we've had one customer where they have kind of a test board and then injecting signals from externally. And like, if you look at a connector, you don't know what's on the other side of that connector. Yeah. So there will be things that humans have to specify that for they sure. they might have to put in there. Fundamentally, most questions fall into the category of trust. Um, you know, like how are you going to be able to actually make sure that, that these boards will work, you know, fundamentally. Um, We've had a lot of interesting requests. Um, so uh, people look for different types of automation. Uh, for example, like we've had people ask for like, hey, can you panelize my boards so of that I can course, like manufacture yeah. them, you know, yeah, at, at volume. Um, we've had people ask for like uh, much more specific things, like uh, apparently in the mechanical keyboard space, uh, they have like definition files for like what kind of keyboard layout you would want. And mm -hmm. then like it might be possible to generate boards directly out of that. And so people ask for like, hey, like, can you take this like obscure keyboard format and like pump out boards? Yeah. Uh, so kind of like feature requests. Um, no, I bet there's a bunch of kind of niches that I wouldn't oh, yeah. even yeah think of like. Yeah, like flex. Well, maybe that's not a niche so much, but like flex boards mm -hmm. is something we've gotten a, a lot of questions about, like, you know, whether we can be able to support something like that. Um, so you have a whole list of uh feature like feature oh, creep yeah. options for the future oh yeah. yeah oh yeah for sure what is one thing uh with in tech that's inspiring you right now separate from quilter and what you're doing there oh man <laughs> if that's there's really anything hard. you have time for <laughs> i mean this it's hard to say there's so many things in tech that are inspiring right now i mean at the very least like um <sighs> Yeah, it, you know, I think two of the big trends that are kind of happening, and this is not my original ideas by any means, I'm copying it from the greats, but <laughs> um, the fact that the cost of energy is going to zero and the fact that the cost of compute is going to zero, I think are two major trends that a lot of people are playing in. So, of course, seeing things like, uh, you, know, uh, f you know, Fusion making big progress and uh, solar and, and, you know, stuff like that, making energy a lot more abundant um, is, is a huge inspiration for what that might imply. Right. Mm -hmm. Like if we have a hundred or a thousand times the energy on this planet uh, or at that much less of a cost. Um, so compute kind of obvious. Obviously, I'm in the AI space, of course, yeah, you know, seeing so the chat GPTs <laughs> and uh, the other generative models out there is, is super inspirational. Um, yeah, I think those are probably the biggest two. Like, I feel like that could be a whole other episode. Oh, yeah. Energy and compute going to zero. I kind of love that as a title. We'll have to yeah. maybe we'll invite you back for that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so speaking of kind of the future of where you want it to go, what do you see? What's the like the big vision, the five year vision, the 10 year vision? You know, you spoke about eventually you want to be able to kind of, you know, cater to all these technical specifications as much as possible. So it can really be universal, like any vertical, any application. Um, do you have ideas beyond that as far as the the solution that you're offering? Obviously, there is a simulation component. Are there other things you want to get to eventually? So it can be kind of all encompassing one-stop shop or do you see it maybe being integrated into a larger solution by another company one day or do you have an ideal of how that would go or is that too yeah, much into the future uh, to even think about in the future <laughs> uh, for sure for sure uh, i mean i think uh, you know the thing that's the thing that's motivating me um to build this in the first place is that i like i want to see this accelerate the pace of human progress you know like i think that as engineers, if we kind of like learn some recipe and just apply it over and over and over again, in my opinion, it's kind of a waste of time. Like, I think it'd be cool if as engineers, what we did was focus on proving that some breakthrough idea was possible, you know, proving that some manufacturing technique was possible or, you know, some kind of approach to some problem was possible. And then as soon as it is like, sure, show it to the computer, have the computer go figure out where it fits best. Um, you know, so like what I really want to see is, is for things like electronics to become really, really, really trivial. Right. Mm -hmm. So where like um, almost like Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, like you dream <laughs> up of an idea and like, boom, it like gets printed out and mm -hmm. it's good to go. And that a lot more people can therefore um, build a lot more different ideas, you know, totally. a lot like what we're seeing in, in software right now. And then last but not least, what is on your personal bill of materials? You can interpret this however you like. However you like. <laughs> Oof. Um, Okay, I'll interpret it as the component that is hard to get that is important on the bottom. <laughs> uh, and the the thing that I have set for myself uh, as a quality that I'm really trying to push myself on is, is discipline. 
um, both in terms of kind of like work ethic, in terms of, you know, improvement as myself, in terms mm -hmm. of improving it, listening to, you know, to others and my team and our customers. Uh, and uh, yeah, and, and taking this like amazing opportunity we've been given uh, as Quilter and really making it into something. Well, that's a very original answer. I'll let you know. So yeah, no one said okay. that before. So that was great. And I think very relatable too, you know, I think we can all, you know, um, maybe not everyone, but that's definitely something I resonate with is continuing to work on discipline and really like prioritizing what, you know, what you do want to improve in areas you do want to grow and continuing to strive for that. So is there anything else you want to mention as far as, um, you know, you have access to our audience right in this moment. Anything you want to plug, give them opportunity to sign up or learn more or, um, you know, if you guys are hiring or anything like that you want to mention, uh, now's the time. <laughs> yeah. Um, so definitely the first thing is, is come come check out our website, uh, you know, www.quilter.ai. We'll put it um, in the show notes. <laughs> great. Um, yeah. I mean, at the very least, we've posted some of the boards that we've built internally so people can at least take a look without even using the tool and just see what the outputs are and see how they work. Um, that's super fun. Uh, I'd love hearing feedback even on those. We have directly places where you can do that. Uh, of course, sign up uh, and uh, let us know what you want to build and uh, get on the wait list. Um, love to see more people kind of using it. Um, and a little bit more of a kind of a bigger ask for some folks. Um, you know, we're already building a lot of boards internally to Quilter just to kind of like push the envelope of like, what can we actually do with full automation? Um, but like, we'd love to work with other people to do that. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sergio. It was great to get to know you more and really excited to keep up with, you know, the future of Quilter. And I'm sure a lot of our community members are going to be excited to learn more and, and maybe get involved if they can. Awesome. Thank you so much. That was my conversation with Sergey Nesterenko of Quilter. We look forward to how Quilter can potentially make hardware, circuit, and PCB design hassle-free as it continues its learning and development process. You can find out more information on Quilter in the show notes. Thanks for listening and until next time. If you like The Bomb, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and share the show wherever you get your podcasts. You can follow Supply Frame and Hackaday on Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, and Design Lab at Supply Frame Design Lab on Instagram and Twitter. The Bomb is a Supply Frame podcast produced by me, Magenta Strongheart, and Ryan Tillotson. Written by Maggie Bowles and edited by Daniel Ferreira. Theme music is by Anna Hogbin. Show art by Thomas Schneider. Special thanks to Giovanni Salinas, Bruce Dominguez, Thomas Woodward, Jin Kumar, Jordan Clark, the entire Supply Frame team, and you, our wonderful listeners. I'm your host, Magenta Strongheart. See you next week.